very nice uh, theory uh, of initia, which can give us finite temperatures. Then we had uh, real uh, uh, difficult experiments with you know, elastic Newton scattering uh, on bismuth ferrite. And now we are coming uh, with expert, which is actually knowing a lot about how to prepare uh, multiferroic materials. Of course, he's not to talking only about that, but uh, if uh, everything works well, we'll get the title, which is single phase and single ion displacive type manganese perovskite uh, multiferroics by uh, Professor Dabrowski uh, from Northern Illinois University. Okay, thank you very much on, t on this last talk in the session before the banquet. Uh, all right, so most of the things I want to talk were already mentioned in the session, except one thing that in my model, phenomenological model, I have a very simple explanation for ferroelectricity, and I found so many exceptions for that today that I don't know. It's like learning French. There are so many rules and hundred times of more of exceptions from these rules. So, so this is the outline, okay? And my basic idea is that uh, ferroelectricity, at least in the simple barium titanate systems like this, which are shown in the phase diagram, is related to elongation of the B side perovskite bonds beyond the equilibrium values, right? So we talk about a little bit about this distortion of perovskite versus tolerance factor, which is the parameter I'm using in all of that. And then in the barium titanate, control of ferroelectric transition temperature and hopefully increased by just simple substitution, like lead substitution, which is obviously increasing TF. And by TF, I mean ferroelectric transition temperature. All right, so then I say now, reasons why there are so many, so, so few ferroelectrics is because tolerance factor around room temperature we had need to achieve is very rare in perovskites. And then I will talk about this uh, simple strontium barium manganite, which were found to be multifero dimension material. System can escape from elongating bonds. Here's no way in three dimensional network has to, bonds have to be elongated. And there are other materials. Now today was the talk about covalent materials. Now the I say these are not good for electricity for many reasons, because of this uh, mixed valency, high spin, low spin, but they show metallic properties mostly. So I don't know how you, how you achieve this ferroelectric materials with the cobalt. And there are problems with many others. This is why I'm saying there are so few true multiferroic, there's only one ion, like manganese. Right, so now the problem is that now we are making material which is perovskite, we have to start with tolerance factor smaller than one, and then because it's going down, to achieve it with tolerance factor larger than one. And this is the trick that we make it here at high temperature, and then we reduce it such that we make hexagonal materials of this form, cool them down at the low temperature, we oxygenate them without decomposition in any case. The reason is when manganese three plus is much bigger than manganese four plus. And then hopefully with this oxygenation, we achieve the range when the tolerance factor is much bigger than one, if it's just a little bit bigger, then we get elongation of the bonds, and if it's smaller, we get these rotations of octahedra. All right? So this is the oxygenation. Now, here I want to make a point because there is this uh, talk about that these materials are bad. All right? So here is the, here is the thermogravity measurements for the strontium manganese, for example under oxygen conditions and low oxygen pressure and then hydrogen. Now this is in the Celsius grade. I'm, I'm, I'm worrying about materials which are about 400 Kelvin and then these conditions, in oxidizing conditions, these materials are perfectly stoichiometric in oxygen. There are other problems like again, they are maybe leaky with respect to resistive materials. And as I showed, they have very large hysteretic behavior. So if you measure something in vacuum, you are dumped to fail because you remove oxygen, like here in example in the hydrogen, in the transition temperature you will lose oxygen and the measurements will be irreproducible on top of the other things. But these materials are perfectly perfectly fine with this respect, single phase and stoichiometric and oxygen. So samples are perfectly fine, but the measurements are the problem, like I don't want to cite Ronald Reagan, but the government is the problem. All right, so unfortunately, we're not the first to measure this, uh, find this uh, 
multifereic behavior, Sakai, 2011-2011 found them, and this is again just in a pure strontium barium system at very low temperature measurement of the of the uh, resistive loop. Now this was because materials are leaky with respect to resistive properties, but when they measure lattice constants, they see transition to ferroectic state when diagonal structure develops, but then when antiferroic transition happens, part of the distortion and sometimes very large part of distortion is going away or even may, may go completely down, right? All right, so we attempted to make them also and we are later we finally made them even though we tried for many years earlier, we achieved only very small range of solubility just for pure strontium barium system. It's antiferromagnetic, completely not changing in the field. Structures the same like barium titanate, except peaks are shifted because this is smaller lattice uh, uh, constant. All right, so here is the example of uh, X-ray experiment with heating for these three samples, and we see just gradual development of this ferroactic transition temperature and suppression of transition at nail temperature. So X-ray diffraction indicates on average structure is a cubic. And this is the third time in my life when I found that X-ray is completely wrong. Here is the example of neutron diffraction experiment, which can find position of the oxygen. Right? So we have basically the same behavior when you look at the lattice constant and see the ratio as X-ray, but then if you look at the bond lengths, you see that it's cubic, now obviously bond lengths, and you can look for the in-plane and, and uh, axis bond lengths. They are going different in the ferroactic region, but then they are also present with different magnitude in the, in the uh, multiparic phase. The only thing is that the average is getting the same as if they were in the cubic structure, so that splitting into longer and shorter is basically the same, the difference bigger is the same as difference for smaller, like, not like in a titanate. Right, so then we have all measurements for this uh, bond lamps, and then the dominant effect really from which we can estimate polarization spontaneous polarization is very large, comes from the bond angle in a plane. So the bonds are basically adding up to the average, but they, because they are off of the plane, we, we see this as an as a angle in a neutron diffraction experiment. So large, well, basically I'm going to conclude now. So bond splitting is still present. You see effect at antiferromagnetic transition temperature, but materials remain ferroelectric below this transition. All right, so it's an example of uh, magnetic measurement into the diffraction. This is indeed G-type antiferromagnetic for all the substitutions, like in a, in a pure strontium manganese system. All right, so, uh, okay, I will stop here, so that will be left. For the next. <laughs> Keeping the time, uh, I think, uh, it's up to organizers to say, but we are closing to the uh, dinner, so are there some urgent questions? Uh, seven. Okay, so actually uh, yeah. we can have questions, and if somebody's courage, he can ask about what, is, what was missing in the talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. A very urgent quick question. Did you correct Wikipedia? <laughs> You highlighted some error in Wikipedia. Did you correct it? Did you actually no, correct it? No, I did. <laughs> I think maybe we have time, so you can tell us maybe a few things uh, with the permission of organizers about the okay. red, there were, there were rectangular. No All right, so I quickly went through, through this region here. Now, actually, development was completely different, but for pedagogical leading, uh, reasons, I started here. Now, these were the first things we found, and then we found this titanium substitute in materials. Right, so now we are going back. Here we substitute manganese for titanium. Now we substitute titanium for manganese in this system. Right, so here are the, all the samples we made uh, with respect, respect to barium content and with respect to titanium content. And here we don't have neutron diffraction experiment, we have only X-ray experiments as a function of temperature. Now this is in the case 
data for the splitting uh, of the C over A ratio at room temperature. I remind you that this is 1.11 for the barium. Titanate, now here we get much bigger values. There is a range we try to look carefully. And then because of the difficulty with the synthesis, now we do not see coherent development of this multiferroic behavior. But clearly there is ferroelectric phase. All of these materials are also magnetic, but as you put titanum or manganese, you are diluting magnetic network. So antiferroelectric transition is going down while ferroelectric transition is going up. You speak to the microphone? Okay. <laughs> and then I cannot see you. <laughs> so. All right, so here is an example of uh, of uh, one of them, so whatever this particular value of strontium, barium, and manganese, titanium doesn't matter. All of them behave similarly, and you see increase of uh, ferroelectric transition temperature above that what is seen in a barium titanate. This is an example of the heating. So we cool it down and heat it up, and then in this case, we have very large steel uh, distortion uh, of, of the C-axis, even in a antiferroelectric phase. And then we have all the measurements measuring uh, antiferroelectric transition temperature. Now, so in the X-ray we see both easily ferroelectric and antiferroelectric transition temperature. And then we have this X-ray kind of suppression of displacive distortion at TN. All right, so with this substitution on the manganese side, now we can control the competition between coupling, between ferroelectric and magnetic orders, and then increase TF or decrease TN, and then how much is suppressed. So then we have different uh, regions of uh, antiferromagnetic and, and uh, ferroelectric behavior. Right, so here is an example of several more of X-ray diffraction experiments with many different samples, but I want to point out this situation here with these compositions, for example, which we measure, manage to measure both on heating and cooling. And I just want to emphasize this point, that here, in this case, the cubic, here is just cubic to tetragonal, and then back to tetragonal or, or cubic at a low temperature, so there are no free transitions. But this humongous hysteresis of this transition, which is now 45, it goes to up to 50 Kelvin. So this is the problem with the measurement, because now if you, if you try to measure this material and you measure it to too high temperature, you remove some oxygen from the sample. Very leaky behavior. And then on top of that, this humongous hysteresis. So we do not have complete, except for the X-ray and neutron diffraction experiment, uh, experiments, proof that they are ferroelectric. Right? So, all right, so the last thing then, good enough Kanamori rules, which I use for the magnetic interactions, predict that if I manage to make this angle much smaller than the one we achieved, we should go to ferromagnetic regime. So that will be the guide to have much larger bond splitting and much larger distortions of this titanium in, a, in this uh, unit cell to go into ferromagnetic, because actually we would like to have ferromagnetic and ferroelectric. And as I pointed out, I'm from magnetic area, so TC for me is ferromagnetic transition temperature, and TF is ferroelectric transition temperature. Okay, with that, uh, let me thank you again, <laughs> and let's thank all the speakers. <laughs> Do we have an announcement from, for the dinner? We have, uh, we have a banquet now uh, till 9 o'clock. We've actually, I, I hate to say this, but... Uh, uh, we, we actually uh, have budgeted, uh, even though we don't have like drink coupons, like one uh, drink per person. But uh, if you have two, that's fine. But uh, just keep that in mind. So uh, thank you.